from 2014 to 2015, I was in graduate school. For me, graduate school was law school at Pepperdine University School of Law, specifically at the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution. And I was hardcore. I did two summers and then I did two spring semesters, two fall semesters so that I could finish quickly rather than elongating the process. Maybe in hindsight, I should have slowed down a little bit, but I thought it was wasteful financially. And, you know, overall, that was a lot of money anyway. Was it or not wasteful? <laughs> it's yet to be seen in my life. In any event, I wrote a paper sometime probably between June and August of 2014. It was in that summer block. I had a great professor of cross-cultural dispute resolution or cross-cultural navigation or cross-cultural studies, uh, Korean-American, Christian from the Midwest. He was, I believe, from Mizzou University School of Law, and he was a visiting professor for that summer. He was an intellectual property professor who allowed me to actually do a paper about the abolition of an intellectual property. That was great, but that's not this paper. This paper is about the Hmong. The Hmong are a group probably most greatly known for Anne Fadiman's text, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, which is the story of one epileptic baby who is trying to make it in an American society with a classic clash of cultures between a top-down authoritarian society, which is the status quo United States, and the anti-authoritarian bottom-up society, which is the Hmong. And that's one group among many called Zomians. And Zomians are probably also popularized by James C. Scott, author of Seeing Like a State, author of The Art of Not Being Governed, who's shown us that there have been over 100 million people in the 20th century across eight Southeast Asian nation states, including China, Thailand, Burma, and so on and so forth, who lived statelessly, who lived in the mountains, who lived with slash and burn agriculture, who lived with shamans who lived with no written word and who did this intentionally, not like as a throwback to primitivity, but an intentional primitivity that maybe is superior to at least some technological arrangements. And there's something to be learned there. In any event, I wrote this paper called The Radical Dispute Resolution of the Hmong while it was at the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution cross-cultural conflict and dispute resolution. Give me liberty or give me death are words you know well. Do you know the greater context of American revolutionary Patrick Henry's words? Here is a snippet courtesy of William Wirt, Patrick Henry's biographer. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased? at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Without stereotyping, saying all members of a group conform to certain standards, we can talk about group's modal tendencies or proclivities. Anne Fadiman's The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down Among Child Her American Doctors in the Collision of Two Cultures is a bowl of fish soup. Given that her book is about the Hmong, a people whose essence was called fish soup by a professor of French, you should have no look of bewilderment whilst reading and digesting this claim. I cannot express to you what fish soup in a better way than the Hmong who say, Heis quaj sub quam sub, to speak of all things. Used at the beginning of an oral narrative as a way of reminding the listeners that the world is full of things that may not seem to be connected, but actually are. That no event occurs in isolation, that you can miss a lot by sticking to the point, and that the storyteller is likely to be rather long-winded. If I were the reader... Prior to my reading of the Fatiman text, by this point, I would have lost my mind in frustration, seeking a thesis or aim beyond whatever vague notion the title of this paper had divulged to me. Bear with me. I was born and raised in the United States, where monochronic demands to start and complete tasks in one, two, three, or ABC order are adhered to. 
my university paid me in scholarships to be a trained collegiate debater that uses the two-pronged monochronic weapon of clarity and concision to write and orate. Critics and my friends raved and ranted about the film There Will Be Blood. I saw it when it came out on DVD in early 2008 and abhorred it for commencing with what I remember as 15 minutes of no commentary by any character or narrator. I have not fully plunged into a high-context way of speaking. Here on out, my argument will be precise and direct, but I hope you were able to learn about the radically different culture of the Hmong through the way I selected to open this paper. My professional and academic interests, along with my hobbies in college, were political. When I read Fadiman, as when I read most texts, I see politics. My analysis is filtered through this lens. The Hmong have a proclivity towards liberty. All that would hold them back from wholeheartedly backing Patrick Henry's words listed above is how individualistically it is phrased. Idleness would be diametrically opposed to mungness, were mungness a word. They fight or they take flight, but they do not submit. Bond servitude and chains are prices as foreign to the mung as requesting the services of a zviksneeb or a shaman would be to the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew I. I is such a value concept in the U.S. that it is capitalized. It does not hold the same importance amongst the Hmong. If Hmong elders learned Patrick Henry's words, I'm certain their ever-adaptive minds would conjure the phrase, give us liberty or give us death. Liberty or death is the ultimatum of an anti-authoritarian. The dispute resolution of the Hmong in Lao and in everywhere they lived before the war in the mid-20th century was radically different than the dispute resolution of the United States of America. The Hmong had anti-authoritarian dispute resolution, and the United States of America's dispute resolution can accurately be called authoritarian in comparison. From the root up, they were different. We could look at micro-dispute resolution. We could look at how neighbors deal with neighbors, how patients deal with doctors, or how strangers deal with strangers. This would help us glean a little information, but a macro study of Hmong dispute resolution would be far more illuminating. On a macro level, a centralized federal government runs the United States. The primary resolver of disputes in the United States is this government or its smaller state and municipal subordinates. This is a top-down system of power. Let alone a centralized federal government, the Hmong had no federal government to speak of. For millennia, the Hmong have lived in anarchy. When I say anarchy, I do not mean chaos. The Hmong had sophisticated governing structures guided by religion, shame, elders, tradition, and much that I do not know. There is no clearer sign of this than the thousands of pages of laws created yearly in the United States compared to the zero pages of laws that the preliterate Mung, or maybe anti-literate, I should say now years later, this is a case of written versus unwritten dispute resolution. Fadiman quotes Fua, mother of the protagonist Leah Lee, describing the anarchy she used to live in. You own your own fields, your own rice, your own plants, your own fruit trees. I miss having something that really belongs to me. Here lies the radical difference. In the United States, you are taxed on your home and the products of your labor whether you consent to it or not. The United States' courts, arenas of dispute resolution, back this process. If a portion, determined by the central government, of your fields, rice, plants, and fruit trees does not belong to you, then they do not really belong to you. This is most highlighted to the Hmong when they are banned from making animal sacrifices and when Child Protective Services confiscates their children. Fadiman removes even a modicum of doubt when she says the Hmong want to be left alone to be Hmong, protected from government interference. What happens when they are left alone to resolve disputes? 500 Hmong become 1,400 Hmong who prosper and produce more than 70% of all the vegetables sold in French Guyana. The Hmong opinion of licenses and the bureaucrats whose diktats they sprout from can be understood from learning the Hmong proverb, to see a tiger is to die, to see an official is to become destitute. If literacy was a light year from the Hmong, then licenses were light years away. 
Pages 225 to 226 talk about a dispute where government authorities told Hmong they could not fish in a county lake without a license. The Hmong in the text showed little deference to the doctors, whose schooling and licenses would mean nothing to the Hmong in their disputes regarding medical care. What do the officials in the United States use and mandate that all the denizens of America use? They use and mandate the use of fiat paper currency. What did the Hmong think of paper currency? The Hmong accepted no paper currency for their opium, only silver bars or piastres.